Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. I was once described as the manager, the mentor, and the visionary who went to the theater with an unfocused dilettante and raised the curtain on a superstar. Hello and welcome to episode 17 in our series that explores the history of Main Man, which was a groundbreaking management rights company that reshaped the business side of rock and roll in the 70s, becoming synonymous with the decadence and indulgences that are now rock folklore. The door to the next room opened and 15 undercover policemen ran out and ran into the suite. <laughs> <laughs> And anybody who had drugs on them, dropped them on the floor. Main Man was formed by Tony DeFries, an entrepreneurial impresario who worked with a diverse range of clients that included Amanda Lear, Dana Gillespie, Lou Reed, Mick Ronson, Mick Ralphs, John Mellencamp, Iggy Pop, Mop the Hoople, and David Bowie. My last official duty with David Bowie, I ended up in jail. In this episode, we're marking the 50th anniversary of the album The Man Who Sold the World, originally released in America in November 1970. Now, it's regarded as a classic and a great example of the way that David's music was evolving as he searched for the elusive follow-up to the success of Space Oddity. As we've heard previously, the album was written and rehearsed while David and his fellow musicians lived together in Haddon Hall and produced by Tony Visconti. At the time, David was inspired by a diverse range of intellectual heavyweights like William Blake, Alistair Crowley and Franz Kafka, and his lyrics were considerably darker than earlier songs, exploring themes like madness, violence and alienation. None of which interested the record company at all. Once David delivered the completed album, there wasn't a lot they liked, to say the least. They were unimpressed with the music, the artwork and the title, which they changed without checking with Tony DeFries or David. Tony, can you tell us the story behind their reluctance to stick to the original plan? So we originally um, had looked at an album title that was a play on Metropolis. I'd shown David the movie, the old black and white version, which I think was silent. I subtitled, yeah, I did. And he was thinking about how to create some kind of a stage performance that reflected what was going on. Um, It's ultimately where Diamond Dogs came from, that and George Orwell, I think. But when the album was done, a lot of it seemed like a fit for what was going on in Metropolis. Metropolis is a futuristic science fiction, probably the first science fiction movie ever made, actually. It involves robots, what were later to become androids. But robots... and workers who are human robots and a love affair between two underground workers, which actually gets reflected again in Orwell's work. So that it had a lot of different themes that were very appealing to David because he could see turning them into songs. The underground workers and the above-ground overlords were one of the themes, for example, that you can see and hear in these songs and other themes of course are more like Running Gun Blues which is almost certainly a Vietnam War inspired song so you've got these different themes that would have a lot more meaning so Metropolis rather than using the actual title of the film which we could have used it because a Metropolis really is derived from a Greek word and just means a population centre. So as far as infringing on the film, we wouldn't have done that. But the idea of Metropolis was more appealing to David, um, and it made sense. When we gave the album to Mercury, they didn't like the title. Again, probably because they weren't familiar with the place it came from or because they didn't think their audience were sophisticated enough to be familiar with it. Who knows which. The other problem with record companies is they were frequently out of touch because they were run by people who were out of touch. And they changed the title to The Man Who Sold the World. 
because it had had some traction. And David wasn't happy about that. What he also wasn't happy about was the sort of cartoon cover. So later on, we reissued the album. He persuaded them to reissue the album in the US with the dress. And then as an album, Mercury weren't happy about that at all because they said no radio station will play songs from an album with a man wearing a dress because they'll see it as somehow playing into homosexual behaviour when actually it's androgynous rather than homosexual. But ultimately, that was released in the US and then in the um, UK. But a lot of the other songs on that album also deeply reflect David's overriding concern with the mental illness that was not just in his brother, but also in some of his mother's sisters and some of his cousins. And that was a concern that influenced a lot of his writing. And of course, All the Mad Men is exactly one of those songs. And it's one of the songs that follows that earlier piece of poetry. So with no interest from the record company, you continued with your plan to extricate David from his contract and eventually place him with a company that did see his potential. While all that was going on, you just kept working with him on perfecting his live performance. Yeah, I think that my approach to Dave was always that he has to be focused. He's a bit like a guided missile. You can't just launch him and hope for the best. You have to have a place for him to go. And if you want to change the place, you have to have the ability to say, OK, we're not going to send that missile to Liverpool. We're going to send it to Los Angeles. You have to be able to make that choice and you have to be able to change it because, let's face it, sending David to perform in Los Angeles at the very beginning would have been a mistake. They weren't ready for him and he wasn't ready for them. But opening Ziggy in... Cleveland was enormously successful because we already knew that they were the hottest fan base for David in America and we already had a massive support from the radio station there and we had promoters who were willing to do Cleveland because they knew it was a place they could sell tickets for him and that's very different than the traditional approach of where you reach out. This is what almost every manager did in that era. You reach out to promoters or agents and you say, I've got this act, this is what they sound like. We don't know what their audience is, but we think they'd fit on to such and such a bill. And then you try and put them on whatever bill. So there was very little reason at the beginning of the day to put the Rolling Stones on bills that were dominated by Tina Turner and Otis Redding. (laughs) I mean, albeit the Rolling Stones have got a great uh, writing opportunity from the Otis Redding song, which they made theirs. But it wasn't their audience that they were appearing to. It's the same as ELO going on a bill with a bunch of American performers And it's not their audience. Mott the Hoople made the same mistake for years and ended up being at the point of breaking up because they just spent three or four years doing something that didn't produce any results. So I couldn't see doing that with Bowie. I couldn't see putting him in a circuit where he would be, let's say, at the bottom of a Grateful Dead bill or the bottom of a um, Jefferson Airplane bill. He wasn't going to win there. Could we get him on a Led Zeppelin tour? Possibly, but most unlikely. Even though I knew the folk, I didn't think that they were going to appreciate him in the way that I saw what was possible. So this is the dilemma that you have if you don't have a plan, and if the plan you have is so fixed that you can't change it. You have to be able to have a plan where you make certain decisions which are not fungible, And the plan has to include the ability to change and change, the way the Americans would put it, on a dime. Don't wait to change. Don't 
miss opportunities because you're not ready for them. Don't say, I'm going to turn that down simply because I don't think we can get away with it. But rather take risks. Say, I'm going to headline Carnegie Hall with a performer nobody's ever heard of. Because if you can get away with it, it's a great stunt. It will get you a huge amount of press, which it did, and a huge amount of attention, which it did. And it will make every promoter in America wonder why they haven't heard about this chap who's just played Carnegie Hall as a headliner, on his, not on his own, but as a headliner who is then well-reviewed. Why don't we know about him? Who is he? And it's very similar to going and doing this theatrical type of rock and roll that nobody's ever seen before. Tommy was a wonderful piece of work that The Who did, but they couldn't actually make it a viable stage presentation. Ultimately, it became a great film of a rock opera and a wonderful piece of work. And Pete Townsend is probably uh, as equally talented as any other guitarist you could find. And has got a wonderful imagination for putting together that, what was really a sort of domestic drama of English working to middle class life. But getting that into a touring perspective, something you can actually take on the road and do in a hundred cities, that's really, really hard. Maybe one day, to quote David, a film will be made of Diamond Dogs, a full movie, which of course will mean recasting all the people because none of them can do that anymore. But it is potentially out there to do. Even though the response from the record company was underwhelming, they did eventually agree on a short promo-only tour of the US starting in late January 1971. What made them agree to that? Well, that goes back to the problem between Mercury and Bowie. Although there were some younger people, mostly PR people, all the people running Mercury tended to be oblivious to the idea of what Bowie was. And I didn't try and persuade them because I didn't think they would see it or get it. So I rather tried to persuade them that they weren't doing enough because they're certainly in the UK, they'd done zero to promote David. So they weren't likely to change because again, they were always decided and defined by what their parent company, because since David was signed to Mercury and Philips were only a licensee, Philips couldn't spend a single shilling on David unless Mercury approved it. And Mercury generally didn't approve it because they didn't see the potential. They were reasonably generous about paying for recording costs, but actually promoting the recordings once they made them wasn't in their budget until he had a hit. So the idea and uh, the behaviour of record companies in that era was very much that, that we'll go on making records with you until you have a hit. But if you don't have a hit after the first X records, well, initially it was like, we'll make a single and put it out, see what happens. If it doesn't get radio play and it doesn't turn into a seller, we'll have to think about whether we make a second single or a third single or a fourth single. When it came to albums, it got even more difficult because albums cost a lot more than singles and you couldn't put them out without a single because in those days nobody played albums if there wasn't a single. You had to have a single. So you then had, you had to record either singles and put, then put them out as a sort of chain of singles on an album or get a hit single and then put out an album. And that became the norm. People who didn't do that the people who said that's not the right way to go were people like David Geffen, who simply said, I've got these fabulous artists like Joni Mitchell or the Eagles or whoever, and I'm willing to take the risk and I'm willing to put my faith in them because they put their faith in me, but I need support from initially distributors and the distributors that he picked, people like Atlantic or possibly Warners, I think, at the time, saw that 
he was signing up bands like the Eagles or performers and writers like Joni who were having success because they appealed to an audience that those record companies really didn't know how to approach. So they did support him and he managed to create a very successful independent record company, Geffen Records. There weren't many of those people around. If you had skills as a producer, you didn't often have skills as a promoter. David had both, and he also had skills as a person who recognised talent for talent, not because it was necessarily going to be commercially successful, but simply because people who made up the Eagles many of whom had been previously in Linda Ronstadt's band, and David was a supporter of Linda to begin with as well, became the people who drove the future of music as, if you like, the California rock. And there were many, many bands in that space who became successful. So here's David, who's an English folk singer as far as my career concerned. And he's made this album that Mercury simply didn't understand. They had no clue what was going on here. They'd never heard music like this before. They didn't know what it was. And it was way ahead of its time musically. But what they saw when they put it out in America was that music critics, especially the Mendelssohns of the world, the people who were ahead of the curve, were very enthusiastic about the album and the single actually when it came out and when those sort of progressive radio stations that were influenced by anything that was new enough that they couldn't easily describe it but that music critics they respected the respected music critics the people who had bought into people like Jefferson Airplane for example those critics could persuade progressive radio stations, FM stations, to play these peculiar and strange and out-of-the-genre records. And so that's when Mercury said, well, even though we're having these disputes with DeFries, we'd still like to get him over to the States and see if a promotional tour which was much easier than a working tour, meant that they could spend a little money, bring him to America, introduce him to music critics that already liked him one-on-one, get him to radio stations that were already playing him, and maybe that would build up enough enthusiasm to um, get him an American hit. Again, it was always a particularly flawed way of doing business. It didn't make any sense at all. It would be a bit like making a new commercial product, something like a, um, a blender, let's say, and putting it out in the hope that people would like it enough to tell other people to buy one. You can't do that. You want to put out a piece of commercial work and you want people to buy it. You have to spend money to promote it. Because the record companies had come from a place where they got lucky They fell into, in most cases, an industry that they weren't part of. And they discovered that if you found the right group or right performer or right writer or right singer, all of a sudden you could sell lots of stuff and make lots of money without doing anything or spending any money. And all you need to do is hire people who knew what was going to be popular next. And if they were right, you were ahead. It's a little bit like um, writing a new app. It's like an Uber. It's like if you can discover the right app, like TikTok, that gets people involved and makes them tell other people what a good idea this is and you should listen to this rap, you should listen to this singer, or you should get this app. It's what has made the internet as successful as it is. A lot of the people doing it have no idea why it's successful, simply because they don't understand 
the code or the software or the attraction and the examples of from Microsoft to Facebook, Facebook to Netflix, are if you can find a new way to do a thing and you can get people involved in a platform. And that's what I was trying to do with David, create a platform that was lyrical and musical and would have worldwide appeal. That was part of my reason for letting it happen. I could have said to Mercury, no, he's not going to go on that tour. But I decided, because I'd already been to America in the 60s and met with people and seen performers like Janice, and I'd met Linda Ronstadt, and I'd met some of the folk in her band, and some of them, of course, became the Eagles later on. Um, I don't think I'd met Geffen then. I met him later. I think I met him later. But at any rate, I, I saw that if you brought a writer, especially a writer, from the UK to the US, the impact was enormous because in many ways the best songwriters were songwriters who had either come from or been to. And of course you had these two examples of um, people that I'd actually worked with, Graham Nash, who ended up being obviously the Nash in Crosby Stills, and Stephen Stills. And the idea that if you expose David to America, you'd get an instant explosion of imagery as well as lyrics, not necessarily the music. I mean, I always took the view, which probably another reason that Visconti and I didn't entirely get on, that if you're going to make one person a star, the music is going to be very important, but ultimately you can always get extremely capable and very often highly talented musicians. So the idea of a permanent band wasn't in my agenda, and frankly it wasn't in David's agenda either, because he was always willing to look for the next piano player, the next guitar player, the next bass player, the next drummer. But ultimately, if you're... And in a way, I think my model for this was probably Dylan. Dylan, on his own, when he was still acoustic, was tremendous. But when he decided to go electric and added people, it didn't diminish his performance at all. And so that's what I wanted to explore was how you could broaden David's exposure to stuff. And that's why he and I discussed a lot of different topics and writers and authors in the early years, in that 1970, 71, 72 era. So I just saw that as part of an ongoing process where he'd encounter different music, different musicians, people that he already knew about one-on-one, and it would give him a deeper perspective. And it worked. No doubt that it worked. None of the tracks from the album set the charts alight until after the success of Ziggy in 1972, when David's earlier albums were all re-released. And then Lulu recorded a version of the title track with David and Rono producing during the pin-up sessions in France in July 73. How did that come about? After the Ziggy retirement, we had already arranged since we knew that Ziggy was going to be retired on that particular concert. We also knew that David um, had agreed to go to the premiere of Live and Let Die because Paul McCartney, who'd written a theme tune, asked him and me and Angela and Melanie to be his guests. And off we went. And the following night we had organized this party at the Cafe Royal which has become to be known as the Last Supper because it was post Ziggy but actually all it was was a party that I had planned a year earlier for the moment when David would be able to attract an audience of major stars and there are various lists of who we'd like to be at that party that include people like Marlon Brando and Janet Leigh and many 
performers, including the Beatles, uh, obviously including Mick and Bianca, including Jeff Beck, who played at the last concert, and a host of other people. Those lists changed over time, so people like Marlon Brando had either not answered or indicated they wouldn't come. On the other hand, many people, like Tony Curtis, had said they would come, um, George and John and Paul and Richard had said they would come, uh, and so on. So we knew who we were going to get, and the whole thing had been organised and was ready to go, come the day after the premiere. So Lulu was one of the guests who'd been invited, and she duly came, and there she met David, and he already was familiar with her, of course, because she was already a well-known performer. And he loved her voice, as many people did, and so he asked her if she would record that song. David always knew that he didn't have the world's best voice. As a singer, he was less than impressive. He would like, as most singers would like, most songwriters, I should say, would like, to get his work covered by people who had a voice that could outperform his, and he knew that she could do that. She's a tiny little girl, Lulu, smaller than David and Rono, with a huge voice. She's sort of like a Scottish version of Brenda Lee and very popular in the UK and worldwide. She was quite happy to come and do the song, although she wasn't familiar with it and she really didn't know what it was about. But nevertheless, she knew she could do it. It was in her range. And David also knew that she could do it within her range. In fact, he wanted to get a deeper, hoarser vocal. So when they did start recording it at the Chateau with Mick doing the arrangements and playing guitar, I think, as well, David actually was encouraging her to take a smoke during breaks so that she does a slightly more raspy voice at a slightly deeper level, which actually you can hear it on, the, on her recording of the song, which was massively successful, very popular. It's a little bit reminiscent of Hendrix um, doing All Along the Watchtower, the Dylan song, and doing it so well that Dylan actually then started using Hendrix's version of the song and eventually called it Jimmy's song because he felt that it was so much better than his. Jeff Buckley is a great example doing Hallelujah, which is a wonderful version of a song that was written by Leonard Cohen. And Buckley's version far exceeds in terms of pathos and passion on both sides than the version that Leonard Cohen recorded. So that you have, in many cases, David's more of a poet than he is a singer. Many of his songs are more lyrically powerful than his version of them. So another great example is Nirvana's version of this same song, The Man Who Sold the World, just before Kurt Cobain departed. He did this wonderful version with Nirvana of the song. And a lot of other people have done, obviously done various songs and made tremendously good versions of them. Same with Dylan. Streisand did Life on Mars. I don't necessarily consider that a better version. I think in some ways David's version of that was better than Streisand. Oh, and she, of course, was another guest at the uh, Last Supper. And somebody... Um, failed to notice that she'd been seated next to her divorced husband. So we had to quickly reseat them both. <laughs> always a slight, uh, there's always a slight air of impending disaster when you do these kind of things. Um, you know, a lot of very, very, uh, what shall we say, passionate and tempestuous people gathered in a small space and you can't afford to put the wrong person next to the wrong person if you see what I mean. <laughs> 
Looking back now, 50 years after the release, it's hard to imagine how much of an impact the cover picture of David in that Mr Fish dress made with the establishment of the time. It was controversial, but also it was very clever. It was. And there were three things that happened in this same space, really. One was that cover, which made a huge impact. Number two, of course, was David having a baby and then admitting that he was bisexual. And it comes along with sort of hunky-dory and the whole Lauren Bacall look. And then you have this moment where he does this improvised fellatio performance with Mick Ronson on stage. And we have a photograph that I take a full page in the, I think it was the Melody Maker, for, and that then becomes reproduced in every newspaper in the UK and many, many um, publications in the US and makes David an instant, probably the first gender-conscious performer. Because nobody else has ever done that before. Nobody else has ever said, I'm going to do this on stage after admitting that they're bisexual. Those three things taken together really did push David into a limelight, and they did it on both sides of the pond. So although some select sections of the music press and his, at the time, very small fan base understood and appreciated what David was saying by wearing the dress, we've heard previously about the reaction from the establishment. For example, how difficult that cover image made it for David to be booked on television. That didn't happen for another 12 months. So it was a great idea for the fans, but not for the record company. Yes, but they couldn't help you anyway. The only people who could help David's career were an audience of people who were young enough to get it. If you weren't young enough to get it, you weren't going to come to a... I mean, I never saw somebody in their 50s coming to a Bowie concert and, you know, full Ziggy gear. Um, But I saw lots of people in their teens and 20s doing that and even in their 30s. And it's very hard to get people who are sort of past their 30s, especially then, not so much today, but very hard to get people to do anything that's um, outrageous, unless they're already outrageous by nature. So one thing it immediately did was it gave David a worldwide fan base of people who were also gay or had tendencies to be gay or were sympathetic to gays. And that was an enormous um, fan base, actually, because there were lots and lots of young people, and especially young people, who had to suppress the fact that they wanted to be able to dye their hair and dress up. And here's somebody who could not only not suppress it, but could actually make it something to be proud of. So that was a big audience for David. And funnily enough, especially in America, where you'd expect it not to be the case, but America always had a youth that were willing to adopt a new thing. And once it was adopted, it got to be very, very um, widespread. Again, the reason for trying to push David into fame, avoiding the pun, but to make him famous in America was to make him famous in the world. And he did. So that's the story behind The Man Who Sold the World, released 50 years ago in America. Largely ignored at the time, but now considered a rock classic. And the album that marked the beginning of David's remarkable journey to megastardom. There are some great photographs and fascinating articles, telexes, letters and production notes from the Main Man Archive, part of an ever-growing collection of memorabilia, a lot of it never seen before, that we are adding to the Main Man Label website each week. A really fascinating record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening. Thank you.